We'll talk in particular about the home builders ETFs, talk about the different ways you can play home builders through the lens of ETFs and strength and weaknesses of those different approaches. My guest is Leslie Juflas. Leslie is the author of Trade What You See, a local Seattleite here. Can't wait to hear what she has to say about the markets. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks so much for joining me today and every weekday to look at today's trading from a technical perspective, connect it to the long-term trends, see how the short-term relates to the long-term, and, and make sure we're on the right side of, uh, of where the momentum is shifting. Um, my guest today, uh, Leslie Juflas, is a co-author of Trade What You See and, and uh, sent two fantastic charts. And, and really relating the short term to the long term. So a perfect time to bring her on and think about uh, what we're seeing in the market today. We have new closing highs, new intraday high, highs on the S&P today, uh, but driven by energy. So a bit of, a, uh, of an interesting uh, evolution of how the market has, uh, has sort of played out today. But we're certainly seeing the upside follow through. And, and the question we've had up until today, last five days have been sort of choppy sideways. Today's sort of the first here really seemed to be pushing uh, further to the upside. So does that have staying power? Is that telling us more about what's to come in the coming weeks, coming months? Or is this a last gasp higher before we start to pull back and, uh, and back and fill. We're going to try and answer all those questions uh, here coming up, but I did want to highlight some of the upcoming events. Uh, first off, we'll be speaking at the Traders Expo in New York. It's coming up very soon, actually, March 7th through 9th uh, in New York. It's actually in Brooklyn this year. Um, should be a lot of fun, and a number of my fellow Stock Charts contributors are going to be there with me. Uh, so we'll look forward to capturing a lot of really good interviews, similar to what we've done uh, with some of our previous trips uh, for the final bar. Also coming up on this show on uh, February 20th, we have Sam Burns from Mill Street Research. That's tomorrow. Um, we also have YouTube live Q&A tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. If you go to our YouTube channel, hit subscribe, hit notifications, you'll get an, an alert when we're answering questions real time. Should be a lot of fun. On Monday, our next episode of Behind the Charts will be released. That's featuring Craig Johnson. He's the technical analyst at Piper Jaffray in Minneapolis. On February 26, Julius DeKempner, Mr. Sector Rotation, will be joining us. This should be a perfect time to think about tech versus energy and all these movements that we've had. And then we'll finish off with Scott Smith from Briefing.com. So we have a lot of fantastic uh, guests coming your way and a lot of great events on Stock Charts TV. So, so uh, look forward to having you join us for a lot of those. Let's move on to our market recap. So as I mentioned in the introduction, we've had sort of a nice uh, up move today. The last, uh, you know, yesterday when we were talking and the day before, we sort of had a doji type of uh, candle with the open and close pretty nearby on the S&P index. Um, you know, really hadn't gone anywhere in five sessions. We sort of had that jump up and then sort of stabilizing, hit in an equilibrium. Today certainly felt like a, a follow through to the upside with an intraday high, a new closing high, all of that suggesting, you know, strength over, uh, over weakness. When we look at just the intraday trading today, this is looking at a five-minute chart for the last week. So this is today. We have uh, Tuesday's session. Excuse me. Monday was a holiday. So this is the last Friday, Thursday, and Wednesday. We can see that a bulk of those gains really came uh, at the beginning of the day, right? The first... Uh, you know, uh, six hours or so, five hours, and then uh, the last hour really more distributive. So a bit of an interesting uh, combination of strength from yesterday's close, but really sort of fading into the end of the day. And as we've talked about many times, that's when institutions, a lot of ETFs, that's when a lot of the big changes are going to be made, made at the end of the uh, at the end of the session. So interesting to see the last couple of days have been more distributive. Uh, but overall, again, you can't deny the fact that uh, the market has remained in a position of, uh, of strength. And today certainly feels like, as I said, some follow through. The S&P closed up almost half a percent about. Um, we're sort of processing those last, uh, last uh, bits of ticks. But overall, about half a percent mid caps trailing a little bit, but still up almost half a percent. And then small caps up the least. So again, we have this situation of the market going higher, but with the largest names sort of driving it. That's a familiar pattern because it's been that way, boy, for a long, long time. Nowhere that you see the NASDAQ 100 up almost 1%, though. So almost double the return of the S&P today. 
The sector picture gets interesting because we have energy at the top. I tell you, talk about a frustrating technical experience is the XLE. It's sort of feast or famine. It's at the top of the list or at the bottom of the list. I can't remember when we've seen it in the middle somewhere. It's usually down here at the bottom, which is where utilities and real estate and then consumer staples, some more the the defensive side of the ledger really weighing down uh, here all down uh, on an absolute basis and certainly underperforming today. But you have energy at the top, so what does that, you know, how does that sort of fit into the long-term uh, trend? That's an interesting question. Technology number two, which is, uh, which is pretty strong, and then financials number three. We've talked about the challenges with financials and the market going higher without financials, but today you actually had financials outperforming, the XLF up more than the S&P today. In terms of some of the themes we can pick out looking at ETFs, you had commodity-oriented markets like Russia and Brazil, really uh, oil-oriented markets doing very, very well. On the downside, you had uh, Japan, which we've talked about that chart. You know, that's one of those charts where even when the price holds up okay, the relative strength has been so difficult, and that's why it's tough to take a, a shot at something like the EWJ. If you look at the price chart, you can see it's now testing. Yesterday, we talked about it testing the low. Now it actually feels like it's breaking down below that most recent swing low. So, you know, again, at a time when so many markets, so many stocks are sort of long and strong up into the right, something like the EWJ on a normal market day, market regime would probably feel okay. But because other things are doing so well, Japan actually feels relatively weak, right? So pay special attention, relative strength for certain on uh, times like that. If you look at the, the industries that are up the most, you see a couple energy ones. Again, I'd always hesitate. When you see coal up here, it's, a, it's been a tough, tough chart. I wouldn't worry too much about it. That's coming off of a very depressed uh, level. But some of these other ones have actually been fairly constructive. Automobiles actually rallying really nicely. That's uh, a Tesla's group, and that's been certainly a, a great story there. Semiconductors, actually one of my three and three, if I remember right, is the semiconductor relative performance. You can see uh, the tech semiconductors group making a new intraday high, new price. High. This is using the Dow Semiconductors Group. We could look at the SOX or others, but I think I'm even more in, uh, impressed by the relative strength going to new highs. So this has been a group that certainly feels like a leading indicator, a bellwether index. When that group is doing well, uh, we're in pretty good shape as a market, and that's sort of what we're seeing there. Interesting to see a number of energy groups, including EMP stocks. And again, remember, these are coming off a very depressed level. So talk about a group that looks very unlike the average group out there, right? This is part of the energy sector, which has been relatively weak. You can see the relative strength is down a significant amount over the last year. But just starting to have this basing pattern and really this consolidation pattern in equilibrium around 555. And if it's able to start moving higher, that would be an, an interesting, different look than we've seen from, uh, from a big group within energy. And again, I'm always looking for themes that people are underprepared for, underpositioned for. And I would say outperformance of energy would certainly be one of those that I would be, uh, I think a lot of people would be caught uh, off guard with. Interesting to see on the downside, you have a financials group, mortgage finance names, which are down significantly. They had a rough couple weeks and certainly fell through. And then most of the bottom performers today were real estate. And real estate as a sector is one that's looked pretty good. But if you look at some of these groups, this is diversified REITs. It sort of rotated from a position of relative strength, sort of felt pretty good, like it was starting to improve year to date. And then the last two weeks have really rolled over. It's now broken down through the 200-day moving average. The RSI never really got above 60 in a meaningful way. So all of a sudden, this is starting to feel much more negative on a relative basis than it had. This had been really compelling going into uh, the month of February. So I would pay attention to some of those regroups, maybe look in, the, in a little more detail, because some of them may be starting to show some relative, uh, relative weakness uh, compared to what they've, uh, what they've done so far. That's our recap for today. And again, what I like to do with the recap is start with the big picture, go through sectors, and then go through some of the group and industry themes. I'd encourage you to use this as the starting point to a deeper analysis that you're able to do using our platform uh, after the markets close. That's where you can really start to discover opportunities and look for, uh, look for what's what. We need to move on with the show, though, and our next segment is called ETFs Engage. Uh, one of the things we had talked about was trying to make ETFs a little more understandable. I found, uh, and if you caught my behind the charts conversation, I think this was aired on Monday uh, with Eric Balchunas from uh, Bloomberg. He's their ETF strategist. We caught up with him at the Money Show in Orlando a couple weeks ago. And there's a really good discussion talking about some of the uh, bells and whistles of ETFs, all of the misconceptions or misunderstandings of ETFs, and also some of the challenges. And again, a number of times what Eric mentioned in the interview, and if you missed it, go to our YouTube channel and, uh, and check it out, check out the replay. But he talked a lot about how, you know, the, let the buyer beware, right? Ca caveat emptor and, and 
let the buyer be aware of what they're actually purchasing. Because with ETFs, there are always these unintended bets, unintended uh, exposures that you might be making that you're not so, uh, so sure about. Yesterday in the show, I kind of very quickly at the end of the show, one of my three and three was Toll Brothers, which is one of the uh, uh, home builders. And I talked about it very quickly and then talked about some of the ETFs that have uh, exposure to Toll Brothers. And I breezed way through uh, a couple ETFs, the ITB and the XHB. And I thought it would be helpful in today's session to kind of dig a little deeper, maybe fill in some of the details that I completely blew through uh, in the interest of time yesterday. And the point of this segment is to really think deeply about some of those ETF uh, uh, themes. So with home builders, I'll start with this. So the, the, there are different ways you can look at the performance of home builders as a group. Number one, you can look at individual names. So if you look at Toll Brothers, there's Pulte Homes, uh, DR Horton, there's a number of the, the you know, sort of the large mid-cap home builders that you probably are familiar with. It'll give you a good sense of what the group is doing, and you can look at, uh, here's is the chart of toll. We use this as our three and three because it's testing trend line support, the RSI's, uh, you know, potentially bottoming out uh, around 60, and the relative strength is testing trend line support as well. I think it's interesting that, you know, potentially if you follow sort of the traditional you know, long-term strength, short-term weakness theme, which is what I've, I've, I've tended to follow over, uh, over many years, it seems like a compelling opportunity, right? A long-term uptrend, it's broken out, pulling back, so it's sort of at the lower end of this uh, regression channel, if I drew a regression line starting at the, uh, the beginning of the year, so overall, potentially compelling. But how do we think a little more deeper about uh, home builders? So one is to use the Dow Industry Group, so dollar sign D-J-U-S-H-B, just stands for home builders. Um, you can get that off of the Industry Summary tab, so if you go to our Charts and Tools page, go to Industry Summary. If you go down to Consumer Discretionary, which is what holds these groups, you can go down here to consume, uh, Home Construction. This is where it has the, uh, the home builders. Below that are home improvement retailers, things like Home Depot and Lowe's and others that are kind of related but not actually in the home construction business in particular. The chart of the home construction index looks like this, and it's a pretty good proxy for what sort of the average home builder uh, stock looks like. So, um, you know, Pulte and, and others sort of look like this, where you've had a nice basing pattern going into the end of last year, a nice rally, pullback at the beginning of the month, but now, uh, you know, sort of at or near new highs. Most of them have sort of tapered off a little bit in the last week, and the question is, what's next. And what concerns me about home builders is this bearish divergence like we talk about with a lot of groups right now, right? You see higher highs in price, but weaker momentum. And so is that a, is that a sign that momentum is waning and we're going to roll over? Or do these hold these levels? Do they sort of, uh, you know, resistance becomes support, the 1090 level or 10, 1085 level on something like the uh, home building index might be interesting before we sort of text and tech the next leg higher. And so that's why I think it's an interesting uh, sector to look at, interesting group. Now, if you want to go deeper than that, there are a couple ways that you can uh, break it out. So uh, one is the ITB, and the other one is the XHB. Those are the two most liquid home builder ETFs that I tend to follow. They're similar, but they're actually a little different. So the ITB is the iShares Home Construction ETF. Um, I go to ETF.com often and sort of look at the construction of some of these. And if you look, you'll find that if you go down to the stock weighting, you can see that a couple of the big home builders, in particular DR Horton and Lennar, are a huge weighting. They're sort of double the weighting of most everything else. So then you have NVR, Pulte Home, and then you get to things like Home, home Depot, Lowe's, Sherwin-Williams. So it has related stocks. Masco would be another one, sort of home uh, improvement retail, but it's also uh, you know really leaning toward the home builder. So in, ter in terms of a pure play on the home building group, that's pretty liquid. It's one of the better uh, places to look. The other option would be XHB, and again the chart's going to look pretty similar because it has a lot of the same names. But what happens is the construction of it is is different, and that's what uh, that's what makes the difference. So if I look at the XHB and look at the uh, construction in terms of the stock weightings, you're going to find that it's similar, but it's a little more equal weighted. So here, Lennar is only 5%, Pulte is about the same, then you get to Home Depot, it's more of an equal rated. So the top 10 are all about 4 to 5%, where the first one, the ITB, has a, had a much heavier weighting on some of the larger a home builder. So again, all else being equal, if these stocks are sort of doing the same, the ETFs are going to have a similar performance profile, but they could be very different depending on whether some of those particular, the, particularly the big home builders are going to do better. They're going to outperform. You'll see that ETF do better than, uh, than something like the, uh, uh, the XHB, which is more equal weighted. The reason why I think these are helpful is if you look at 
the relative performance of this stock. So if I'm looking at Pulte Home Group, um, I'm now looking at, and this is using Gaddis Rose's chart style, which is fantastic, by the way. I'm looking at the stock relative to the benchmark. I'm looking at its sector, consumer discretionary versus the benchmark. But here's where we're starting to use the industry group. So I'm looking at home construction relative to consumer discretionary and Pulte relative to home construction. Now, I could easily swap in an ETF here. I could put in the XHB, for example, if I would rather look at whether it makes sense to own Pulte Homes versus the ETF versus the sector or something like that. I could do that. So using these ratios, you could do any of those combinations. But this is a great way to sort of answer those questions. How are home builders doing relative to consumer discretionary? They've been outperforming for the last you know, year or so. And I can see that by the fact that this pink line is going higher. Next, I have Pulte versus home construction. So is Pulte a good bet relative to the other home builders? And this line, purple line going up, shows you that it's consistently been one of the better places within home construction. Now I can start to see, though, but at a sector level, consumer discretionary certainly um, you know, flopped a little bit. So even though I'm doing well uh, owning a home construction relative to other bets within consumer as a whole, what is my consumer discretionary uh, weighting? Probably should have been a little lighter because of the underperformance in consumer discretionary. So on that one chart, you can actually look at the ETF or the index, look at the industry, home construction relative to the sector, relative to the benchmark. You can do all these different combinations to try to answer that question. If I want exposure to home builders, do I want to own this particular stock or own an ETF or own the sector or just sit in a passive product, look at the, uh, at the broad market? So in conclusion on this one, overall home builders, I think, are a really compelling uh, place. I think you could look at it in any of these ways. The XHB and the ITB are the two most liquid ETFs people use to track this space. They've all sort of have this bearish divergence or this non-confirmation with a higher highs in price, lower peaks in momentum, which is a potential area for concern. And I think if I was looking at one stock like we talked about yesterday, I think Toll Brothers is an interesting one only because it's sort of at a period of long-term strength, short-term weakness. And again, in a vacuum, that's the type of chart I like to consider for long position because the long-term trend is positive, but in the short term, I'm able to buy on the dips, get a better fill, get it at a better level. And overall, if the long-term trend continues, I've, had a, I've been in a, at a good opportunistic pot. So I think this is the, uh, an interesting chart to look at in particular, TOL, um, to get a sense of it. And that's our segment on ETFs Engage, looking a little more deeply at some of the home builders ETFs and how to think about them in terms of your, uh, your portfolio weighting. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with my guest, Leslie Juflas. See you in a minute. Welcome back to the show, The Final Bar. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close to think about the markets from a technical perspective connected to the long-term trends. Please keep your questions and your feedback coming to us. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com is the best way to get a hold of us. Uh, that's the way we'll uh, collect your uh, questions and hope to answer them later this week on a mailbag segment. I want to bring on my guest, Leslie Juflas. Leslie's the co-author of Trade What You See and also uh, from Trading Live Online. Leslie, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Dave. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. And we are underweight local Seattle guests, and I very much appreciate you having you on the show. And you sent two charts ahead of time, which is great. The first one is looking at a daily chart of the S&P last six months or so. What is this telling you about the market here? Well, what I wanted to show you today, Dave, is um, momentum shifts that tend to occur. And they, they tend to occur um, on the smallest time frames first, and they work their way up to the larger time frame. So we're looking at a daily chart of the SPX. And really what we can see here is where the RSI range is marked in. There's been a, a break of that smaller range where those blue arrows are between the blue dashed lines. And you can see that the RSI broke 
a, below that small range to the downside. Now, as the price came up from there and made new highs on this newest breakout, um, the RSI has not made new highs with that. So it's showing us that there's a loss of momentum um, right now on that RSI. And if, for those that don't know, Wells Wilder uh, is a developer of the RSI. It's momentum oscillator. Uh, and I like to use it, and I especially like like using the analysis of the ranges with it. Now, if we could switch to the 60 minute chart, I think this is where things can really get interesting, is the opening up the lid of a daily or weekly or monthly time frame and starting to drill down to the smaller time frames can give us a lot of information. When the momentum starts to shift, they're going to show up on the very smallest time frame first. And we're usually just dropping like a pebble in the water. It's not going to make much of a splash. Um, but as they start to work out to the larger time frames, we start to see some larger swings in both directions. Um, and there uh, looks to me right now there's a period of some distribution going on and some rotation going on. This chart is showing, I use um, some Fibonacci ratios in the work and analysis that I, that I do. And this chart is showing us that the swings from down to up have been following and creating this natural trend line of these 1.27 swings. And all that means is where that pink X is on the left side of that first swing, if you take that and measure the length of that swing top to bottom, multiply it by 1.27 and project that up, that's where the end of that swing is. So um, I've marked in the, the latest one over in the right-hand corner, which would be coming in just above uh, a few points above 3,400. Um, the momentum divergences are showing up a little more pronounced on this 60-minute chart. And we can see that by looking at the RSI divergence on the 60-minute. Um, we can see that back from the February, the beginning of February, um, when price made that new high, um, the momentum made a new high on the RSI, but as it continued to make highs, you can follow those one, two, sevens up, um, it's been diverging um, on that RSI, and I think that that's, that's concerning right now. Um, the red horizontal line across there is showing us where those most recent February RSI highs are. So it, it uh, poked above that purple trend line just a bit today, but it closed back back down below it. Now, why this is important, there's so many times that, that traders, investors are taken totally off guard by large, swift down moves. And when those moves come to the downside, they are swift and they are they are fast and they're brutal. Um, but if you can learn a process of following the momentum both to the upside and then back to the downside, um, you can learn to watch for the clues of these changes. Now, we know markets can go farther than anyone can expect. And in fact, on the weekly chart, there might be some projections even up around the 3,500 level. But the question is whether some correction starts um, right around these levels here. And how are you going to know that? You're going to know it by your support levels are going to start to break. I have a couple of them marked in on the chart um, to keep an eye on. Um, you're going to get um, false rallies in the morning, followed by um, down closes in the afternoon. Um, another thing that we should be looking at is that we do not have all of the indexes marching in the same direction. The NASDAQ's been the strongest. The S&P has been strong, but not as strong as the NASDAQ. The Dow's been lagging. Transports have been lagging. The Russell's been lagging. So um, that's something that um, that is of concern as, as well. So these charts, if we even drill down to smaller time frames, we would see these same processes. In fact, I noticed today, um, Dave, this, this spy chart that you showed has what's called a, a small 
the intraday had a very small butterfly sell pattern mm. that turned that market to the downside around the close. Um, so those are the types of patterns that I use with this type of technical analysis to um, sort of try and stay ahead of, um, you know, especially a, a decline that can be swift. Leslie, these, the are two, these are two fantastic charts. And, you know, I don't know if you've heard earlier on the show, I, I, I hammer home on the show the idea of connecting the short term to the long term. And I think in these two charts, you've done you've done a fantastic illustration of that, particularly sort of that that fractal nature, right, of the the weakness and the, the divergence in the RSI on the daily chart. But how on the hourly chart, you see a similar sort of uh, pattern emerge. These are two fantastic charts, Leslie. Thank you so, so much for sharing these and, and coming on the show today. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. That was Leslie Jufas. Uh, boy, I tell you what, I, I enjoy talking with people whose toolkits are different than my own. Uh, and, uh, and Leslie does such a good job of talking about that shorter time frame that I tend to not spend enough time on. I, people that I know that deal with more of the hourly charts tend to see some of those things emerge because the daily charts sort of catch up over time. But a lot of times some of those themes will emerge first on the, uh, on the hourly chart like Leslie, uh, Leslie shared. So interesting things to keep, uh, keep in mind as we, uh, as we continue to digest market strength. We need to move on with, the, with wrapping the show, which means it's time for the three and three. So at the end of every show, three charts in three minutes. And I hope these are on your radar from this moment on. First off is the S&P by cap tiers. This is a familiar chart if you've watched the show for a while. I like looking at the S&P and then looking at breadth in the form of the cumulative advanced decline lines for the S&P 500, for the New York Stock Exchange, for the mid cap index and the small cap index. The color coding is my very subjective, very qualitative review every week looking at what these lines are telling me and whether I'm seeing strength neutrality or weakness uh, from the charts. And what I'm seeing right now is the advanced decline line on the S&P 500 on the largest names continues to be constructive, right? Continues to break to new highs, sort of the stepwise motion higher, but you don't see that from the rest of these, right? So the New York Stock Exchange, which obviously has a much broader universe of stocks, thousands of names, uh, you know, a lower peak right now in the, uh, in the breadth, which is why it's sort of neutral colored. The mid cap index may, may be the most constructive out of all these, maybe testing the previous highs, but not there. Yeah, and the small cap, certainly the least constructive, where it almost appears like it's establishing a lower uh, peak. So you have this breadth situation, like, like Leslie was mentioning, on disagreement with some or divergences with some of the other indexes. You certainly see the S&P doing one thing and other indexes doing another. I think that's a great way to illustrate it right there. The second chart for our three and three is the relative performance of semiconductors. We talked about this a little bit uh, earlier looking at the group when we're, we're doing the market recap, but this is one of the ratio charts that I look at all the time. And when this ratio is going up and to the right, as much as you can you know, think about what could happen or speculate about downside risk, as long as this line keeps going up and to the right, one of the leading bellwether groups in the market is doing just fine, and it tells you to relax and ride the uptrend as long as this continues. We had a bit of a hiccup there at the end of January. You can see where this ratio broke down. I was feeling pretty, uh, pretty good about thinking, wow, that might be it. That might be the breakdown in the ratio. But uh, two days later, we're right back higher, and now it's again making new relative highs uh, for the last 12 months. So overall telling you or suggesting for the market strength there. The third is gold. My guest yesterday, Jim Smith from GAN Analysis, was talking about his take on gold using his uh, particular toolkit uh, based on, on GAN's uh, teachings. Here we're looking at a more conventional way of looking at it and a similar sort of assessment though, right? You have a very similar pattern of the last six months to the first half of 2019. So you have sort of this rhyming pattern to the market of a breakout of resistance, a bullish, or sorry, a bearish divergence that resolves to the upside. We've arguably seen a very similar pattern. And if you saw what happened before, we had another big push higher for the next uh, for the next month or so, and arguably, I think that's where we're where we're headed here, right? Where we're starting to see a bearish divergence that becomes invalidated because the RSI once again rolls up, the market goes to new highs. It's not breaking its swing low; it's actually pushing further. It suggests that the momentum is pretty strong. The the key issue here is the fact that. Um, the relative performance of the GLD has not been stellar, right? So it's still a little bit depressed. I mean, it's actually you know in line with the market. You're not you're not getting hurt by owning it, but you're not really outperforming. You'd have to see a pullback in stocks to really see the relative strength. I would argue, uh, probably increase. So if that would happen, that would certainly uh, feel like an interesting uh, place to park for a while. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our show for. Today, I want to thank you for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. You can get to all of our previous episodes, all of our previous interview guests on our YouTube channel. Just look for Stock Charts. You'll see my show along with all the other fantastic contributions to Stock Charts TV. 
As a reminder, we have our YouTube live Q&A tomorrow, 1.30 p.m. Eastern, so make sure you bring up YouTube and check it out there. We'll be throwing a couple charts around and then just answering your questions live. Also, you can shoot us an email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. I'd love to answer one of your questions in one of our mailbag segments later this week. For stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great evening.